Good morning and welcome to this edition of Cervelo Live. Uh, I'm your host, Chris Dames. Hope you're doing really well. Sun shining outside. It's the end of July, it's the 30th of July. Um, hope you're enjoying as much as you can your summer so far uh, and life summer so far to whatever new normal we're moving towards. Um, I'm joined by an, an amazing guest today. Uh, it's Jacqueline. Hi, Jacqueline. How are you? Hi. I'm really good, Chris. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. That's Charlotte in the background testing out whether we're actually live. And okay. I can tell you, are we actually live, Charlotte? Audio too. Audio too. So we're all good. Um, what we're going to do, Jacqueline, is ask you um, a little bit about your business, find mm -hmm. out how you're currently helping family businesses, particularly in these un unique times, and mm -hmm. find out a little bit about how you can help people um, who, are, who are watching these videos, either live uh, or on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. We're just, just to be clear, we're taking the summer off of um, Cervelo Live. We're not going to be doing any over over August. Um, mm -hmm because I'm away and um, I'm away and we've got um, we've got quite a lot going on in the business at the minute, but we are back in September. We've got guests lined up between September, October, and now moving into November. But what I'm interested in doing is making sure that we are, um, we are creating content designed to be helpful. So okay. if, if, you've, if you've got anybody in mind, Jacqueline or anybody who's listening in our audience, has got anybody in mind, please feel free to let us know. But what I'm going to do, Jacqueline, before we move on to your interview, uh, I just mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about why um, people should come as a financial planner, um, but not at every single stage of their life. Um, you know, the service that we provide to our clients is probably pertinent to certain people more than others. And I just want to talk a little bit about the six people who should potentially see a financial planner today. So let me just talk about talk about those first. First of all, um, uh, it's a pretty broad, pretty broad one, and not every mum and dad will need to see a financial planner, but mums and dads certainly. And the, re the reason I suggest that mums and dads need to see a financial planner is because certainly my perspective changed on the world when uh, i had kids i mean charlotte who's now 16 is is right here staying really invisible intentionally charlotte do you want to say hello to the audience and to, to let them know that you actually exist i've done my time on camera so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but your perspective does change when you have kids and one of the things that you become more conscious of is uh, certainly certainly what i did is what happens if you're not around to look after your children. That's yeah. why we'd always recommend mums and dads see a financial planner to make sure that in the event of the worst happening, that their family is fully protected. And certainly when I was, um, even now, because Sophie's still eight, Cassie and I uh, make sure that in the event of us not being around, in the event of our death or serious illness, we've got protection in place to make sure our kids are, are okay. But it extends beyond that. So number one, speak to a financial planner um, to make sure that you've got enough protection in place so that if you're not around, your family's gonna be okay. But number two, make sure that you've got just the core fundamentals in place. Have you got a will? You know, we even though we don't do wills at Cervelo, certainly one of the recommendations we make for the cost involved, which is relatively low, it's really important to make a will. So if you're a mum and dad, um, it's probably worth you having a chat with a financial planner. Uh, number two uh, is business owners. We always recommend business owners have their own financial planner. And at Cervelo, a lot of our clients are business owners um, in a range of different ways, ranging from doctors and dentists to uh, people who own businesses that employ five people, all the way through to uh, uh, directors of quite big businesses and even though your your needs are unique there are a, a few themes when it comes to business owners that a financial planner can help you with number one is protecting again protecting you and your family um, and the business because that's the bit that you need to consider um, in the event of anything 
dry stick and, and critical what happened to you. Um, I, I'd like to think that um, if I wasn't around, um, Cervelo um, would have a, um, there'd be a massive impact on our business. I've got, to, I've got to be honest though, Jacqueline, I reckon the rest of the team reckon that they could probably survive without me, would you reckon? That's a good idea if they can do. Do yourself out of a job. Well, that, that's, and again, for every business owner, I think that's the long-term plan, isn't it? You know, build a business that, that works without you. But most of us... I'm done. Yeah, 100%. Um, but most of us are in that right. period where we're still building towards that. And I know it's a fellow we certainly are. Um, and it's protecting business owners over that transitional period. But in mm. addition to that... Um, it's funny, my, our, our tax bill's due tomorrow. Um, Cassie said to me this morning, is there a way that we can we can reduce this? And um, honestly, tax is part of living in a, for us, tax is part of living in a democratic, um, fair society. I'm quite relaxed about paying tax. But mm -hmm. if I can reduce tax legitimately, I do. And I do. one of the reasons I do that is by making pension contributions because I'd save corporation tax and I'd get to save for my financial future. And for business owners, certainly using pensions as a vehicle to mitigate tax and save for their financial future is quite a useful thing to do. So if you're a business owner, certainly you should be speaking to a financial plan. And number one about protecting the business, but also number two about saving tax. And also when it comes to the financial planning side, um, having conversations about what your longer term future look like. Because as Jacqueline said, a lot of business owners are married to their business. Um, and there's got to be a longer term strategy that means that, you know, is your longer term plan to stay in the business permanently? Or is there an exit involved or somebody else taking over? And how are you building the actions you need to put in place to get to that point? And certainly with a lot of our clients, um, the work that we do supports them to do that. Because what we don't want to do is put a bunch of products in place without understanding the strategy and the longer term plan. So that's certainly something all business owners should do, regardless of it being a one man business all the way up to quite a large one. Um, uh, next one is Gen Xers. Now we're we're doing a we're doing a survey at the minute, Savannah, where we are um, trying to work out where with um, Gen Xers, which are the generation who are um, forty to sixty at the minute, coming up to the uh, the third phase of their life and wondering what happens next. And mm -hmm. I I asked one of my um, team, actually it's our summer intern, Harsha to go out and um, uh, find out what Gen Xers want. So we've got, we're, host, we're doing a survey at the minute. We've got loads of responses come back because um, mm -hmm. I want to really understand what the plan is for a lot of people as they come to their late 50s, early 60s and the next stage of their life. And she said to me, what's a Gen Xer? And I thought, does anybody know what a Gen Xer is? I'm, I'm not sure. It's like a, sort of a bit of a moving face. But effectively, Gen Xers um, are the generation after baby boomers that are coming up to a stage where they're thinking what happens next. And mm -hmm. certainly, if you're thinking that, and a lot of our clients come to us with this, um, they say to me, Chris, I want some clarity on my financial affairs because I'm thinking about what my, the next stage of my life looks like. And I want to make sure that my financial well-being fits in with their, all of my other plans, be it still work but take some more time off or do whatever you need to and speaking to a financial planner can really help you navigate that next stage of your life that's why we always recommend gen x's particularly ones that have accumulated wealth but still not sure about whether they've got enough to achieve what they want to achieve speak to a financial planner because our job is to make sure that uh, effectively they know whether they'll uh, run out of money again or not and if they will, taking the actions they need to to get to get there. Um, my next um, uh, uh, one, number four, is pathroergophobics. Now, Jacqueline, did you do you know what a pathroergophobic is? No, I'm not. I'm, that's the first time I've heard that term. 
I'm thinking, what is that? Uh, well, it, it's. It, do you know what? I had to Google it as well. So, so I I wanted to understand whether there was a allergy or a um, a phobia against paperwork, right? And the phobia to paperwork is um, just the phobia to paper added to the phobia to work. So the phobia to paper is paraphobic and the <laughs> phobia to work is ergophobic. So the, um, the um, an allergy or, or a, um, a phobia to paperwork is paphroergophobic. Now, why do we want to speak to people who are allergic to paperwork? Unfortunately, and it's changing slightly, the financial industry has an obsession with documents, you know, uh, and the challenge you've got is for a lot of people, particularly when they're approaching a time in their life where um, they've got some really important decisions to make, receive tens and potentially hundreds if they've got loads of pension pots, um, paperwork through the post and they look at it and they go i just don't know what to do next i just this the the, the the information you've given me some of it relevant some of it not i'm really finding it difficult to navigate and uh -huh. our job as financial planners is to organize all that paperwork make sure somebody's got clarity so they can make key important decisions of uh, through their life so effectively we might have a client come in with a ba bag of paperwork they've received and because of our experience we can say this is relevant this is not we're actually missing some information we need to help you make some of those decisions don't worry about the paperwork um, uh, we'll deal with it um, what we'll do is come back to you with the key points um, decisions we need to make and support to make those decisions mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people think what we do is all about the product and actually what we believe is that it's more about the outcome and that one of the key things that drives us at Savello is making sure that we're making people's lives easier and certainly mm -hmm. taking all that paperwork, clarifying it into the information you need to know so you can make key decisions is part of what we do. So if you're allergic to paperwork or you're, you're not keen on tackling that pension paperwork, Give us a shout, we might be able to help with that. <laughs> Number five is if you're at a crossroads in your life. As I said, we're doing a survey at the minute um, talking about um, people at a crossroads and what happens next. And what we've done is develop a framework that I'm going to be writing about in the white paper we've got. Um, it's going to be published September, October. Plus, um, after that, I'm going to be writing a book about this, talking about the framework that we recommend people take to think about what happens next um, and that's using the acronym next so that's navigate evaluate execute um i know it's not really an x it starts with an e but i, I sort of cheated a bit there and then track so so what we recommend people do is follow that and then keep on reviewing that as their as their life continues to develop and number six um, a lot of our clients, particularly our more elderly clients, have built up estates where um, there's a, a inheritance tax liability. And there's planning you can do to make sure that you're in a position where your family receive more of your um, assets in the event of your death, but you do need to plan as early as possible. So if you're worried about that 40% tax rate that the tax man takes over a certain threshold, and that threshold depends on your individual circumstances, come and have a chat with us. Come and have a chat with us as early as you can, because there's definite, definitely ways, some of them really simple, that you can use to mitigate a lot of those concerns. Um, hopefully that's been useful. If you've got any questions uh, about any of that, uh, you've got my number on the screen, you've got my own email address, and please feel free to, to visit the website. Um, hope, hopefully that was useful for you, and uh, let's get on to our really good interview with Jacqueline. So Jacqueline, how are you? I am really good. Um, been exercising out every day on my bike, which I only learnt to ride about four years ago, okay. maybe three years ago, um, and enjoying life, looking forward to the future, um, keeping positive, yeah. making plans, putting things into place. Amazing. And certainly, 
Uh, cycling's taken a bit of a resurgence since lockdown. I think the stats mm. were, you know, there's a lot more people out on the out on the road on their bikes at the minute. Have you noticed that being out? Definitely, definitely. Whether you go out early in the morning or later in the evening or in the midday, you'll see people out on their bikes, which is which is good. I um I was in Amsterdam last year. Was it last year? Oh, yeah, I was in Amsterdam last year, and they've got in Amsterdam city centre traffic lights for bikes. So uh-huh. effectively, you've got the you've got the car lanes, you've got the bike lanes, um, and then you've got sort of pedestrian crossings and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and everybody seems to commute. I mean, I I went out for a run at eight o'clock in the morning one. Uh, one day while, while I was away, and mm-hmm. literally there was a bike rush hour. There were hundreds of bikes <laughs> heading into the town. And I think that might be uh, the future, right? I think it will be. Um, recently, uh, I was talking to somebody who is going off to university, um, and he bought a car with the intention of being able to live his social life in, in uni with his car. Um, and he was surprised to find out that part of the contract well, being at that uni is you don't bring a car into the town, you right. use bikes. What what uh, uni was it? I can't remember off the top of my head what it, which uni it was. Yeah, because we, we've got a client in Cambridge and uh, they're a um, tech firm based up there. And it's really bizarre. I mean, I normally get the train up and get a taxi to their office, but um, just every time I go to Cambridge, just the amount of bikes around is is good. And and I think I think the for long distances, I think you know cars cars have their purpose. But just for sort of day to day, I don't mind a bike. I mean, I I I can drive, but I'm. I'm not a massive. Like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say I'm a car nut, so I'm not worried about driving. How about you? I love driving. Do you? Right. Uh, okay. I do. I mean, I, I mean, some. I, I look at people who have automatic cars. I'm like, why are you in an automatic car? You're not really driving. <laughs> What's the point of that? What's the point of an automatic <laughs> car? Um, but yeah, so I'll, um, I'll be that old lady who is still insisting on having a manual car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even, even when, even when we're sort of like all all moving towards um, sort of uh, auto driving and stuff like that, you don't know. Give me my automatic car. I'll be the only human controlled car on the road, but I'm 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 keeping it. Um, so just so our audience can understand a bit more about you, tell us a, tell us a little bit about you. Okay, so um, socially, uh, I said I've learned to ride a bike. I started off on an, an adult scoot on an adult scooter, which my husband bought for me. Um, in my teens, I love to sew, bringing the raw material together, making something out of it that could be worn and was unique to me. Um, I love to sing, and I have sung in gospel choirs for years. Um, currently, seeing one called Peter Francis and the J Best Family. Okay. Can't be able to get together because of social distancing, obviously. But, so that's interesting. That. We've we've got um we've got somebody who helps us out with who helps us out with the podcast, the Kindness Project, a guy called Dave Forsdyke. And he's in a couple of bands and he actively involved in his local church as well. And he's mm-hmm. been doing a lot over Zoom. You know, he's been like sort of doing loads of recordings and then sort of getting one of the guys involved to put them all together. Mm-hmm. Um, has your choir been involved in any Zoom? Uh, we haven't, we haven't as yet. So um, it's been suggested, um, but we're waiting for our choir director to decide if that's what he'd like us to do or not. Apparently, it um, takes a lot of work to. to apparently, it takes a lot of work to put together. Like yeah. that's a challenge. It will. That's, that's the thing because it's it's one thing to get everybody to record um, and make sure that they're all in sync make sure that you know they're all in key and I've, I've seen it done on several choirs and it could be really good but i thought mm, it's a lot of work to get back to that stage even just to do a three minute song yeah yes yeah, that well. takes a lot of work so so singing singing's one of your passions what else um i come from a large love family uh my mother was the eldest of 10 children okay. and i've got 40 cousins around about 37 cousins um so growing up my cousins were my friends and we were a bit we were a bit insular because we didn't we didn't need anybody else we had each other 
When you've got, um, when you've got 40 cousins, that's enough, right? <laughs> well, so half of them are over here and half of them are in the West Indies. Um, uh, whereabouts in the West Indies? Barbados. So, <clears throat> best part of the West Indies is definitely Barbados, right? No, nowhere else. What do you think? I, I like Barbados. I've been to Jamaica. Um, Dominica is the other side of our family. Um, but I felt most comfortable in Barbados. Um, sometimes going around from the landscape, you could think you were in sort of sunny English countryside, not rainy English countryside. Okay, well, that, that's, that sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> right, so tell me, that's a little bit about you. Tell me about your business. So in terms of the business, um, I started it in 2017, um, and I wanted to deliver to everybody, as you do when you're, you're a coach, but then I had to narrow it down, look at my background, and um, I realized that even from my very first job I had, I'd worked in family businesses, at least five family run businesses um, at, of different sizes and at different stages of their existence. Um, and so I thought family business coaching is the way to go for me. Um, and I deliver leadership coaching and development coaching, focusing on the family business leaders. Um, I like to focus on them because it's their vision that has impact on not only themselves, the business itself and the people they lead in that business. Um, it's important that they're able to lead themselves well because they lead their business, they lead their staff, um, they're leading their suppliers, their customers, and even their competitors. So how they manage themselves is important. Um, I work with leadership teams to develop them and through their business policies, uh, their KPIs and their structures with focus on the people. Um, and that team development area is very important because once you're working with someone else to solve a problem, solve a challenge, you are in a team. So just a quick question then. So we're, we're, Sabella is a family business, but we're sort of an accidental one. So we, we, it started with me and then other members of the business, just uh, other members of the family, including my brother and, and Cassie, and my brother Raz and, and Cassie, um, uh, decided to come and join us and, and help, help us grow. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't the plan initially. Um, but it does, um, it, you know, I, I suppose my question on that is, do family businesses typically evolve or are they intentional? Typically they evolve. Um, except if you have husband and wife who've decided from the beginning to come go into business together, or you have, um, you know, aunt and niece or co cousins who find they have the same interests and go into business together. Otherwise, um, it starts with one person and it grows organically. Um, family members may come on board on a voluntary basis um, at first, um, but eventually something has to be put, you know, some, some structure has to be put in place yeah. so that their contribution, their effort is recognised and rewarded. I did. I didn't realise. I didn't realise. I didn't have to pay Rice or Gassy. Can you just? Can you just let them know? I mean, it's. Like, I, remember, you know. <laughs> I just said recognised and rewarded. <laughs> yeah, and we do. We do here. Um, <laughs> and why? Why? Why family businesses? Why? Why choose to help that sort of business? Well, given, given my background, um, once I sat down and really thought about it, given my background, family business seems to be the way to go. Family is important to me as well. Um, and family businesses are in a lot of areas of uh, the British economy. There are nearly 5 million family businesses here in the UK. Okay. Um, and they generate about £1.7 trillion in revenue, that was in 2017 figures. Um, they contribute 104 billion to tax. So it's really good that you say that as a family business, you're not worried about paying tax because we live in a democracy. Um, family businesses, they employ around about 13 million people in the UK. Okay. Um, and so they, they are a big chunk in the UK economy and I thought well 
that's the way to go. They, between them, they've got love, commitment, trust, um, revenue coming in, but often they don't have the structures for growth. Yeah. Um, it's, and it's so I thought that was... Element, isn't it? Sorry? It's, it's the element of organisation that you support them with. You know, if they've yeah. grown accidentally uh, mm -hmm. or, 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 or grown but need to okay. more structure, mm -hmm. you, can, you can support them. What, um, what unique challenges do family businesses face that, that other businesses might not? Um, I think the main one is how to keep ownership in the family. Um, especially when they're growing, how, you know, do they, they, do they allow outsiders to come in sort of if, when, how that, how that happens, that's important for them to, to work out and discuss, um, how to ensure that their staff don't feel excluded or limited in their opportunities. Yeah. Um, for lots of businesses, family businesses, they'll think, well, okay, let's, let's find a space for, fa for family first and then other people. Yeah. Um, so that can mean high turnover in staff if they're, if they're not careful. Well, then potentially that, that can be demotivational for the team that yeah. you bring in, can't it? It's not family because it, if it feels too insular, mm -hmm. then, then, and that it doesn't feel that there's an opportunity there for people coming in, mm -hmm. then why mm -hmm. would people stay? Mm -hmm. Sorry, hold on. Oh. Oh. Sorry, my, um, <laughs> my clock came out to the computer. All oh, right, okay. Are you, uh, are you all right now? Yeah, I'm okay. So, so while, while you're, while you're organising your computer, one thing um, I just want to mention is... The, the other thing that we've experienced is navigating that relationship between working together and living together and having mm -hmm. kids and doing everything else. Mm -hmm. I reckon that probably took Cassie and I about 18 months when Cassie mm -hmm. first joined Savello to mm -hmm. try and navigate to a place where it, it, it was actually clear and it worked well. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find that there's an element of tension in family businesses that come from that interesting dynamic? There's, there are tensions because um, I think when when you are working in a family business, you you can sometimes cross the line where there's no real boundary between family business and the business of family, and so that that creates its own challenges. Um, at home, you may be the relaxed person, but when it comes to work, you may have a different persona. And it's, it's being able to manage that, manage you having those different personas and your partner or wife also being able to, or cousin even, being able to manage that as well. Um, and so there can be some surprises because of, a, of, of different approaches, different um, viewpoints. Um, I just I, I say to people that we are all different worlds and we're trying not to collide and hurt each other and when we're trying to run business together that can that can present a lot of problems um, you know there may be a problem in, at the home which gets taken into the business and therefore the the decisions that are being made may not necessarily be, be as clean as they should be Help me, help me understand a little bit about um, succession because I know I, I recently read a blog of yours that was talking about sort of that that takeover. Now I've got a few years left. I mean, I, like I'm 42 at the minute, and I don't think so. Sorry, I'm 42 at the minute, but in a month I'll be 43, which is a little okay. bit scary. Um, but um, certainly, sort of my 10 year plan is to as we've discussed already make sure that in my own business um i'm needed less mm -hmm. however um i don't think charlotte at 16 um uh, and i'm saying it because she's sitting here as she wants to follow her own path mm -hmm. um and it's interesting how that dynamic works um now I, I suppose you've got two elements of that number one you've got that element where there's an expectation of the next generation to take over a family business, but also the uh, people who founded the business just don't want to let go. And the kids are saying, actually, let's drive this forward. How do mm -hmm. you navigate those two issues as a family business? 
Mm-hmm. Um, well, for me, working with the, the, those sorts of family business, it's looking at it from the two viewpoints, understanding the founders' motivations, their fears, and their hopes, and being able to drill down into that. Because, as you know, with, with business, you can get subsumed by it. And if that's where you get your identity, then that is an issue in terms of trying to of other people coming on board and you handing over. Yeah. Um, and so I encourage people to be honest with their self about what what meaning the business gives to them as, in, as an individual um, and to what extent is their identity tied up with the business. Yeah. Um, I encourage them to see the, the business as a separate entity from them. I mean, if they're, if, they're, if they're a limited company, they are, the business is treated as separate from them anyway. So take that, that, that legal structure and apply it to you, yourself emotionally and in your intellect and see it as a separate person. Um, and just as you would your child growing up becoming an adult, see that business as, as eventually separating from you and having a life of its own. Yeah, yeah. I, I complete, completely get that. And certainly a lot of the conversations we have with clients is, you know, where does your purpose and meaning come from mm-hmm. after work becomes less pertinent in your life um mm-hmm. and that 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 isn't always an immediate switch off that's a transition uh, mm-hmm. over time some people find it really easy some mm-hmm. people find it amazingly easy others it takes a bit of time to get there and certainly part of our role as financial planners is to work with somebody to say we're going to take the money concerns away. Let's focus on making sure that you can live the life you you want. Mm-hmm. What does that life actually look like? Um, well, that, that takes having interest. I mean, I think when people have interest outside of business, non-related in you know non-business related interests, then it is easier to make that separation. But if you've made business your whole life, yeah, then that is that is a problem. Yeah. Um, and you know, people can be really passionate about what they do, but they still have to be able to step away, you know, take a step back, and reflect, take a, a more of an eagle eye view, I suppose I'd call it, and think about you know, if I wasn't in that business, would I be able to survive? Would the business be able to survive? And be you know, be real about the, those sorts of issues. And um, I think. Thinking about that personal purpose as well, what am I really here for, um, is a good way to look at the business as being separate and you being a steward of purpose. I like that phrase, steward of purpose. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm there yet, to be honest, but that's an aspiration <laughs> that, I, that I might, a steward of purpose. Can I have, if I get there, Jacqueline, can I have that on my business cards? Chris Dames, <laughs> steward of purpose. Um, uh, <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell, tell me a little story about how your coaching, uh, particularly in the family business, has, has helped a uh, family business develop. Okay, so... Um... I think of a, there's, a, there's a, a, a business that was a two-person business and it was cross-generational. Okay. Um, and in, in their culture, the junior person would always defer to the elder, show that respect, show that deference. Um, whatever the elder said, that's what went. But, and that was coming, the, the niece was trying to observe that. However, her aunt, who had actually been born in this country, but had spent some time um, in their their cultural land, I'll put it, um, she actually wanted to be challenged. She wanted to hear the new ideas. She wanted her niece to be more um, innovative. And so we had to we we had a discussion using um, family business my family business MOT product to open that discussion up and to help the niece to see that she could really contribute to that de- the decision making and not think, okay, I can't do it because my auntie's there and I've got to show respect to her. 
Um, we looked at their values to make sure that they were in alignment. And they, through, they were able to discuss things that they normally would not have discussed. Yeah. There's a lot of conversation that people don't have because they, you know, it's a bit like getting married. You, you start off, everything's lovey-dovey. Um, the reality sets in and this, this, you realize this, this, there's discussions that you maybe should have had but haven't had because of the excitement of bringing this relationship together. Um, and so they were able to have a, a greater understanding of each other, greater unity and purpose, um, greater focus on their target market. And they were able, from those discussions, to be able to look at getting and going after bigger deals. Yeah. So that affected no, that their mind. And, and it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think we've always been, we've always been excited about uh, taking ideas, fresh new ideas, and mm -hmm. implementing them in the business, and mm -hmm. and I think the reality is they never come from me. You know, Hervé, who we both know, mm -hmm. uh, has been a, a absolute amazing insight in some of the software that we've used for a couple of years. But mm -hmm. he's found new ways to use it and add value to our clients. And sometimes mm -hmm. you need that fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that you're delivering that. Um, uh, I, th I think experience is fine, but just just having that ability to learn as a business owner and continue to develop what you do is mm -hmm. fundamentally important. Um, just one, one important point there, in terms of the recent lockdown, how do you think that's impacted family businesses specifically? Well, for family businesses, because it can be, the, the issue is that um, if several members of the same family are involved in the business with lockdown and so much having been stopped, their own personal incomes are the, the business revenues are affected, and then their personal incomes are affected as well. Um, their morale is is affected, and with so many businesses um, trying to, I use the word pivot. I've tried not, I've tried not to use it today, <laughs> but. <laughs> no, 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 that's banned, that word. Simon used it on Savello Live last week. And, and literally, I, 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 don't know if, I don't know if I've told you, um, but I'll, I'll mention it. We'll, uh, we had a game, I've mentioned it on Savello Live before. When I was working from home during lockdown, we had a game called, um, uh, the kids started, called Chris Dames Bingo, where they had a bingo card on the fridge. Um, with my most used phrases, um, <laughs> and pivot was on there, and uh, apparently I'm barred. I'm barred using it now. I mean, uh, top was this too shall pass, um, uh, but but yeah, that sounds like a <laughs> Yeah, it, well, well, you, you know what? It's it's, it's a real, real real interesting one. I, for me, that was stoic, right? That was a that was a stoic thing. Like just like let's just focus on the fact that recovery might take some time but we'll get there mm -hmm. and when mm -hmm. i was having conversations about it it was, it was more to do with market conditions because markets at the start of lockdown had a bit of a tumble mm -hmm. um, they're back up virtually to normal now but certainly we i was having a lot of conversations with nervous clients and part of our job is to make sure that that that, that they, they're aware that we're on it but actually we're recommending that they take no action investment wise because mm -hmm. selling when markets are down are not are not the thing to do. So we were doing we were doing a lot of work around that area and yeah. making sure we were uh, edu educating our clients and, and highlighting the fact that the longer term nature of investing means that you will get ups and downs, typically mm -hmm. every ten years or so. Um, and this was that that thing and this too shall pass. Um, mm -hmm. But then when I when I realised that Sophie in particular, I mean Cassie printed the the thing out, but Sophie in partic particular, every time I said this too shall pass, wandered to the fridge. I was like, why is she doing that? And it was it was this tally chart that they'd started that just every single time they it was being highlighted. Um, and pivots one of those words, isn't it? It's been mentioned yeah. quite a lot in in business. Yeah. But not, not everybody's been able to do it because they haven't got the structures set up to do so. And so um, I think people who are in um, manufacturing say they were able to do that. Those who um, 
his families were in, in, in the food business in, in terms of you know, quick food. They, to a degree, were able to do that, but not everybody has been able to. Um, and sometimes it, it, it's, sometimes it's down to that structure, but sometimes it's down to that mindset because, you know, that not everybody's good at elastic, that elastic thinking, you know, to think, you know, short term, then stretch it to long term, then come to medium term and, you know, keep visualizing and, and planning and putting things in place. So that's not been, that's not been easy for everybody. And also, fun family businesses, they, they do feel a lot of responsibility towards their employees. So there has been a lot of worry about, you know, if the business closed, what's going to happen to the people that have been faithful to us and how can we maintain that faithfulness to them? Yeah. Um, some of that has come through being able to furlough staff and even directors being furloughed. Um, but still in the long term, there is still that worry about will we be able to survive and and i think for family business survival is very important but as you as you say it's having some of those fresh ideas that potentially come from other sort of members apart from the founder that mm-hmm. that might allow a um allow a business to pivot to something mm-hmm. that might work for them depending on their sector or field now i know mm-hmm. you mentioned about the mot diagnostic um, mm-hmm and how that supports businesses. Help me understand a little bit about how it works. Okay, so I'll tell you how it, it came about. When um, I was, uh, I just had my car at MOT'd, and it suddenly occurred to me, my car is MOT'd every year to make sure it's still working properly and it's still legal, um, and it can do what I need it to do. Why not apply that principle to business, family-run businesses? Um, and so I came up with a range of, of questions um, that would help them to see where their businesses are um, organizationally and operationally. Yeah. Um, don't, uh, the, it, so it's to make sure that they, they've got the structures in place for them to be able to work. So we look at things like their context. We look at the purpose that the business is there for, what questions does that business answer for people? Um, we looked at governance, we look at motivation, we look at the relationships, we look at the interests um, using the three circle model of family business. Um, we look at the threats to their longevity and you know, are there new ideas, new markets they could enter into? And that's a, that's a quite a hefty discussion with the leaders of the business. Um, from that, I analyze what they've said to me and come up with some areas that they should consider for further investigation and continue to facilitate a discuss- the discussion between them to see what their needs are, um, to see if their needs can be fulfilled by me or if there are other, or other professions that should come in and address certain issues for them. Help me understand a little bit about because as a as a coach, part mm-hmm. of your role is to facilitate people to get to their whatever success looks like for them. Mm-hmm. How does that fit into a process that could be actually you should be doing more? You know that 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 quite sort of like if if I go if I take my car into an MOT. It either passes or fails, but we know life isn't like that, right? So how do you how do you how do you square that circle? Okay, so look at their look at their goals. What are the, what do they aspire to be? How where have they come from? How does that all fit into where they're going to go? What are the measurements? So I have my own model, which I call Great, um, which is gather relevant um, evidence, achieve transition. So we look at where they want to be and then work the way backwards to think what evidence do they need to have to show that they are progressing towards their um, outcomes and the goals that they want to to see achieved i really like that great that that that's a that's a good you know where are where do you want to be mm-hmm. um uh and what evidence have you got to see that you're making progress that's mm-hmm. uh, that's that's really good what um where can where can people find out a little bit more about you if they want to understand a bit more about what you can help with? 
Okay, so I've got the website. Um, that's www.dale-coaching.com. That's Dale spelled D-A-L-E. Um, and I'm on Facebook as well. I post on my page quite regularly. Um, I have a thing called Leadership Nuggets um, that I post on there every week. And that's helping people just to think about their leadership and their, their management. Um, and they also can call me on my phone number, which is 0203-290-1253. And what I'll, what I'll also do, Jacqueline, is when we post this out on LinkedIn and on the website, I'll make sure Russell puts all your contact details on the show notes so that if people do want to get in touch, they can. Um, okay. Thank you so much for joining us today. I've really enjoyed the conversation. It's been it's been fun. And as a family business owner myself, I've learned quite a lot. Good. I, you know what? I've got this tendency of inviting people on that I'm going to learn from. So halfway through lockdown, I invited the uh, um, the. Uh, award-winning financial services teacher of the year, Helen Westwood. So okay. she won an award last, uh, last year to, for being the best teacher of um, finance in schools. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought it might be useful for our audience, but if I'm being perfectly frank, um, I learned a lot from her about homeschooling as well. So it was, a, it was a double win, and I felt like today it was a double win as well. So thank you for sharing your insight. Thank you for the invite, Chris. No worries. Thanks to everybody for watching. Um, as I say, we're not around on Savello Live next week or for the next four weeks. We'll be back in September. Um, if you uh, know anybody who might benefit from coming on t- on and speaking to us, who's got something new to share to, to our audience, or you'd like me to cover off a particular topic in the world of financial advice, financial planning, wealth management, any trust, tax expert, um, we're happy to talk about that. Um, Feel free to let me know. Have a lovely remainder of uh, Thursday. Have a lovely weekend. Have a lovely August. And uh, I will see you when we're back. Bye. (laughs)